Now the last few videos were made about a year before gravity waves were actually detected. But over that year, the LIGO detectors in the US were upgraded, as David talked about, uh, by a team involving people from many places around the world. And when they were switched on with the new sensitivity, discovery came rather quickly. In fact, rather quicker than I think most people were expecting. So on the 14th of September 2015, gravity waves from space were first directly discovered. In this video, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we can deduce from this very first signal. This is all very uh, early days yet. Uh, I was going to try and interview David about it, but he's off at conferences with other experts talking about these things. So this will just be my take on what has been learnt so far, based on this paper here, which you can check out for yourself. Here are the actual signals picked up. What we're measuring here is the strain, the fractional shift in length against time. The whole thing takes, I don't know, about a 0.15 of a second. And here's the signal from one of the two LIGO detectors, and here's the one from the other one. What you can see is just noise, and then a signal starts to emerge from the noise, an up and down signal, and the same thing here. And the two signals match up, allowing for the very slight shift due to the time it takes the gravity waves to get from one as opposed to the other. And here we're comparing the, the data, the gray, with the theoretical model from general relativity, and you can see they match up very precisely. Down the bottom we can see frequency in hertz against time, and you can see it starts off at uh, about 40 or 50 cycles per second, and goes up to over 200 in both cases before fading out. So what's actually going on here? Well, this is a classic chirp signal. This is what you expect from the in-spiral of merging objects. So the idea is we have two heavy, compact things, and they're close to each other. As they orbit around each other, that means they're accelerating. Therefore, gravity waves are being radiated, which is bleeding energy away. As it bleeds energy away, they come closer. As they come closer, they spin faster. Therefore, gravity waves are emitted more strongly, so they come closer still, even more emission, closer still, even more emission, until they merge and then settle down to something spherical. So what you expect is a frequency that's increasing, intensity that increases, peaks at about the time when they collide, and then tails away. And that's exactly what you see. What can we deduce from this? Well, the simplest deduction comes from the early stages. When you're in the late stages, you need a full supercomputer numerical relativity simulation. But in the early stages, there's an approximation, the chirp mass. Now, this is the equation for the chirp mass. It's the mass of the two objects multiplied together, divided by the sum of the two masses, basically. And that you can work out from the data here by looking at the frequency, to the minus 11 third power, and f dot, which is the rate of change of the frequency. So in the early stages here, you can see What's the frequency? How fast is it speeding up? And that tells you the chirp mass. And the chirp mass comes out as about 30 solar masses. Now, does that mean the objects are 30 solar masses? Well, not really. It could be that, because of this rather complicated equation, it could be that you've got two things of maybe 30, 35 solar masses. Or it could be one thing that's very low mass, say one solar mass, and another thing that's, say, 1,000 solar masses. So if it's two objects about the same mass, they're going to be about 30 solar masses each. If it's one um, that's less massive, the other one has to be very much more massive to make up for it. So what can we deduce from this? Well, basically these things have to be black holes. Why is that? Well, we don't believe that neutron stars can exist much above the Chandrasekhar limit of about 1.6 solar masses. So that's telling us that at least one of these two things is much heavier than a neutron star, and so it would have to be a black hole. Could it be a black hole merging with a neutron star? Well, not really, because if that was the case, to get this chirp mass equation, one object would have to be um, more like a thousand solar masses merging with the one solar mass object. You could get that up here, but in that case, the event horizon of the thousand solar mass black hole would be so big, you'd never get to these high frequencies here. They'd merge before they got to that stage. So the fact that it kept going all the way up to frequencies of over 200 hertz tells you there really have to be two black holes. Now to get more information, we can do a full fit to the entire curve. That's what this red line is here compared to grey, which is a smooth version of the data. And from that you learn that one of the objects must be about 36 solar masses, the other one about 29 solar masses. 
They can't be spinning too fast. They have to be black holes. When they got to this point here, they're only 350 kilometers apart, which is when they started merging. And what you can see is the black hole model fits very nicely. It predicts that they should merge about here. Um, it gets, this is what you'd expect from the event horizons of the things. And you can see this ring down where it keeps vibrating, but less and less. And that's actually what the numerical general relativity calculations say should happen to a black hole. There should be a period when you get a rather distorted event horizon before it settles down to a circular one. And that's indeed a very good fit to the data over here. So this is very interesting. We have two black holes that are not quasar type black holes, not billions of solar masses, but still pretty hefty, tens of solar masses, so about 30 solar masses. And that in itself is a bit surprising because you expect in the last stages of star death, huge winds that blow mass away. These winds obviously can't be too massive, otherwise you'd never get things this big, unless these black holes themselves form from the mergers of something else beforehand. So maybe we're talking about a 50-60 solar mass black hole each, two very massive stars, 50-60 solar masses, which burnt away, blew away maybe 10-20 solar masses, leaving 20-30 to 30 behind in a binary pair which then merged. So that's interesting in itself. The fact that we saw one of these signals so early is consistent with what we know about black hole populations. You can try and estimate how many black holes there should be out there. Should be out there. Uh, it's a very uncertain calculation, but certainly having a gravity wave signal of this strength seen within the first few weeks of turning it on is actually quite consistent with what we think we know about black hole populations. But really the crucial fact is this is telling us, I think, almost beyond doubt that black holes really exist. All we've known before is that there are very dark, very compact objects. We believe that neutron stars can't get to the sorts of masses and the sorts of compactnesses needed. And we believed from our study of general relativity that if you made anything much denser than a neutron star, it would be inside its own event horizon and would have to collapse. So that kind of indirectly said that black holes had to exist. But if general relativity wasn't quite right under these incredible conditions, and maybe you could shrink a neutron star further without it sitting inside its event horizon, then maybe you could get uh, some sort of quark star or there might be some other more exotic thing. We didn't really know for sure. But here we can actually trace how and when this thing merged and therefore measure what the event horizon is. And the general relativity explains the entire shape of the curve with exquisite precision. So this has tested general relativity far beyond where it's ever been tested before at incredibly strong gravity regimes and it's passed with flying colours. Damn, Einstein, just too smart for his own good. And so it really looks like, as general relativity works that well, that black holes have to exist. So I'm always fairly sceptical about these things, but here the data are now so good, there's rather little wiggle room left. So a very exciting result, and the dawn of gravity wave astronomy.